Welcome to the San Jose Hockey Now podcast. I'm Shang Peng, Editor-in-Chief of San Jose Hockey Now. You can also find my work at MEC Sharks and on Twitter at Shang underscore Peng. And I'm Keegan McNally. You can find me on Twitter at half underscore hockey at my website, half-wallhockey.com or at San Jose Hockey Now. This week, exciting week for us. Exciting week. Uh, we have the senior NHL writer at ESPN and the man who nominated GM Mike Greer, the author of the worst team in NHL as GM of the year, Greg Wyshynski. Uh, we talked to Greg about the national perception of the Sharks' rebuild, and we make Macklin Celebrini to Salt Lake City jokes a good week before the Coyotes' uh, move to SLC was leaked. We talked to Greg about a week and a half ago. Yeah, it was kind of crazy because we were like, oh, there's no way they're going to move to Salt Lake City, and then now it's like they're already there. <laughs> Almost. S.L. Celebrini. <laughs> S.L. Celebrinzies. The, uh, yeah, the Salt Lake Celebrinis. Um, we, uh, this week, we also have a few other topics, just like we have one more game of the season yes. left, mercifully. One more, yeah. Mercifully. <laughs> but we're going to talk a little bit about Clinching the best uh, lottery We're odds. We're number one. We're number one. We did it, guys. We <laughs> tanked ourselves into oblivion. We're clinching the best odds. We'll talk a little bit about what odds those are. Um, some Will Smith speculation, uh, whether or not he's going to leave college after Boston College uh, lost in the final of the Frozen Four. Um, we're going to discuss a little bit about the games that we've... we. Uh, I had the last week before we saw you guys last or after we saw you guys last and um, some of the interesting recalls and injuries that happened um, to kind of get us our final roster for the end of the year. We have some uh, talk about Luke Cunning again Luke Cunning and charts and charts. And, oh God. I, I got the chart you guys sent me. <laughs> Everybody loves Jay Fresh's hockey cards. Anyway, um, Sharks and Kuda awards that happened this week. Yeah, we'll get Keegan's uh, thoughts on it. A couple of um, interesting uh, choices. Not bad choices, just interesting. And finally, um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Shang's thoughts on him seeing Philip Beastat live uh, for a couple of games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, it's going to be a, a pretty long episode, but it's a good one, I'm sure. All right, where do you want to start? Well, let's talk about uh, Macklin celebrating not to Salt Lake City, yeah. but to the Sharks instead, hopefully. And yes. the Sharks are, uh, are are in the pole position for that. They have a 25.5% chance of uh, getting the number one pick, which should be Macklin Celebrini. If you hear David Quinn talk mm -hmm. about uh, Macklin Celebrini, uh, <laughs> that pick's already been made. <laughs> yeah. Um, David Quinn said, uh, I put in a story, just uh, uh, he values all three zones. He's like Jonathan Taze, but with more skill. <laughs> God, you can tell, you can see David Quinn just salivating, being like, please, yes, please, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> I need this guy. But yes. Um, it would mean, like, yes. So the Sharks have 25.5% at first, 18.8% at second, and 57 at third. They can't which... drop below third overall with the uh, recent draft lottery rules. So just a uh, reminder of everyone on that. To... Yeah, that's helpful for sure. Because that, in my mind, gives us one of like Celebrini, Demidov, or, or Levshinov, but I don't think they're taking Demidov. So, we'll dig so harder knows? on who the Sharks uh, might think about. Yeah. Uh, if not Celebrini. Uh, but let's just keep talking later. about Celebrini. Yeah, let's, much... let's keep the good vibes going, all right? Uh, I talked with uh, Rick Celebrini, uh, Macklin's uh, uh, dad, um, earlier this week. No, last week. Mm -hmm. Last week. And uh, Rick, of course, is the Golden State Warriors Director of Sports Medicine and Performance. I mean, he's a big deal with the Warriors. And anyway, uh, it just so happens, though, his son is also a pretty big deal himself. And yep. is about to be the first overall pick. And uh, Rick says that, yeah, of course, his family will be excited uh, to have uh, Macklin uh, come come to town. Uh, Rick and his family, uh, they live in Livermore, so not too far. And mm -hmm. so they'll be able to come to to San Jose uh, to see uh, to see Macklin all the time if uh, that that happens. And so hopefully, uh, you know, Gary Bettman, uh, do your magic. So uh, yeah, the, little, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't I mean, I can't think of a single hockey dad that would want their their kid playing like within an hour of them in the yeah. NHL. Like, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just it seems like it's too good to be true at this point. And I'm just really waiting for the letdown when it doesn't happen. <laughs> like Chicago has 13.5 percent. Our, our Salt Lake City has 7.5. So if either of those uh, it, well, they, they could change a little bit by the end, but if you have those I, happen, I you, have you know, it's yet. rigged. This is going to be a, a bill daily. Oh, <laughs> I haven't had this calendar. Nah. <laughs> and with the first overall pick, with the first overall the pick, Chicago Blackhawks. <laughs> oh man. I mean, 
I'm going to be a little sad, guys. Like, I, <laughs> I think I was more sad last year, but I'm going to be a little sad. Last year, though, the odds were not in the Sharks' favor. Obviously, sure. uh, Eric Carlson, enemy of the tank. Uh, mm -hmm. Kevin LeBanc uh, scoring mm -hmm. like three points in a game. <laughs> yep. I think they had a little three game winning streak there. Yeah, Noel Gregor decided uh, to, to get hot there. So, uh, But... This yeah. year, man, the, the losses have been such a grind. I think uh, um, yesterday, the loss to Edmonton, a 9-2 loss, was their seventh loss this year of six or more goals, which is the most wow. in the NHL. Anaheim has four, so that's a lot more. Um, the third most in Sharks history behind predict predictably the first two seasons. Uh, and yep. uh, first two seasons, they had nine such losses in each of those seasons. So seven, that's, that's a lot. And so anyway, it's been a lot, a lot of suffering uh um to get uh this uh, uh these best odds so yeah mm -hmm. if you don't get that number one pick especially in this draft where there is a clear drop off from celebrini on on down at yeah. least right now players can develop obviously um uh obvious example of that colorado uh, 2017 they were hoping for that number one pick for uh Heischer or patrick and they end up with number four and they got kale mccarr who is <laughs> ends up being the, the the best player of that draft at least right now um, so don't know, yeah. but right now though, there is a clear drop off after number one. Uh, I think everyone pretty much agrees on that. Yeah. we oh got, I think it's going to be, I think they said somewhere May 6th or May 8th, somewhere around there that they were going to get the draft. Yeah, I thought it was sixth or seventh. That's what I've been yeah. putting out there. So if that sixth. data has changed, I guess, because it, no, it's, people aren't even clear about the NHL playoff, uh, as yeah. they do, and that we're like four days away so. at some point i do like so. the playoff commercials this year i think they're if you've been watching them i, and I, I saw watched. one with the sharks there, there was a yeah. there, there was a one about some some kid getting a a, a 2019 uh, vegas stanley cup uh, yeah they mentioned the sharks in one of them <laughs> so the sharks made it to the playoffs guys so there you go yeah there, there's one about um a national fan bringing in a, a catfish into the arena it's, it's yeah. they're actually pretty good lineup pretty good commercials. Okay. yeah okay. The NHL normally has good commercials around this time, and you know I'm I'm, I'm here for it. But Sharks will not be joining the rest the of the NHL. Be, no. <laughs> but it's a mercy end, honestly. <laughs> like I'm ready for this season to be done with. So much, so much. <laughs> well, let's let's talk fun. about let's let, let, let's move on to more uh, good. Let's mm -hmm. uh, we do have to talk a little bit about the the, the last few games that we watched. We'll touch on yeah. it, but let's talk about more about some good exciting news. Will Smith. Uh, Will Smith is now uh, available and free to sign with the Sharks. His season just ended with uh, BC, not quite the way you wanted. Did not win mm -hmm. the national championship. I do wonder if that will kind of. Um, uh, uh, way on his decision. But uh, one thing, though, that I did sort of uh, dig around on yesterday and I was told uh, it was that that uh, that there is no hurry for for Will Smith to come out. And I know some some people uh, have already been saying that. Some people who are a little more attuned to the CBA, I should be a little more attuned to it. But I had thought that a lot of people thought that um, that that Will was going to be able to burn a year if he came out quickly uh, for the Sharks. Mm -hmm. But it, because he's so young, 18, 19 years old, he, I, it, that doesn't happen with 18, 19 year year old players, even NCAA players. We know yep. with uh, Willie Mecklen, uh, the Sharks have been able to slide that contract. But uh, anyway, so. Will is 19, so if he signed with the Sharks right now, or even if he signed right after National Championship, the only reason for him to sign would be just to get his angel debut out of the way, which would be two games if he had signed right after they lost, or one game right now. And there just isn't really too much of a point of that because you're the contract he'll sign will just slide. There's just again, there mm -hmm. just isn't isn't a huge reason for him to do that. It also, gives him more time to decide what he's going to do. And yeah. I do think that that is. Um, Obviously, we saw uh, Cutter Gauthier, he signed with the Ducks, but Cutter is 20. And so his contract uh, will burn. They will burn a year off uh, when Gwen Cutter plays uh, for the Ducks. So there's a motivation for him to uh, sign immediately right after losing because Cutter's a year older. But that line there of Leonard Perot Smith, they have a chance to stay together. Um, I. I wonder, yeah, I, I, I would have to imagine they're uh, thick as thieves discussing what, what they're going to do because, mm -hmm. of course, they have a good shot of, of, one, of, of getting a national, bringing a national championship uh, uh, home uh, next year and staying together for one more year. But on the other hand, though, uh, Will, from what people I'm talking to, 
I know we had Cam Robinson on last week and he was a bit down on Will, uh, but I have an article coming out that you guys will, will like a good uh, a, a contrast to what Cam was saying. Uh, I've talked with the three scouts. They really like Will a lot and they think he's ready to come out uh, next year, even with the Sharks where they are and 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 whatnot. Um, and so anyway, so I'm excited to, to put that piece out. But with Will, though, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, I use examples in the story. Uh, Trevor Zegers signed three weeks after his uh, season ended with Boston University. He was 19 years old. Um, Logan Cooley uh, didn't didn't sign with yeah. the Coyotes until July, which was a couple months after he lost a national championship, like Will Smith, uh, mm -hmm. as a 19-year-old last year. And, and after he had already said he was going back. Yeah, too. and he said he was going back too, right? Mm -hmm. um, so... So there's so basically Will has a, a, a lot of time to to decide, and as we saw with a cool, he could even reverse his decision, right? Yep. But um, I think though, though the one thing though that people are telling me is that they think he 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 actually could be ready, and actually maybe even more ready than his line mates, which I thought was interesting to hear too. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, most anyway. of the time people kind of push back that Leonard probably would be more NHL ready, maybe not higher ceiling right now, but he has like a. a the play, like the way he plays, is just more NHL ready than Smith. So that's interesting. That's um. There's a the reason know. why Smith went fourth overall, though, right? Of course. So, yeah. so so maybe maybe this is you know again I don't want to give away give away that article that that's coming out, but um, but uh, I be think, excited uh, about Will Smith. So let's yeah, <laughs> whatever I, happens, whether he goes back or not, I think he. I'm gonna say he goes back and be pleasantly surprised if he comes to the Sharks. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my prediction. Is that I'd rather. I don't want to predict that he comes to the Sharks and then he he goes back and I feel sad about it. So I'm going to predict that he goes to the to BC and they all go back. Um, and they I, play I, the, I, I think he comes out. OK. All right. Sweet. So we can we, one of us will be right. It'll be great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and either way, it'll be fine. Um, they, they're going to play as like the top line of the World Juniors as well. It's going to be a continued. Oh, well, uh, they can still do that, right? Yeah, like, of Even if Will comes to the Sharks. Yeah, it just gets a little bit weird um, with prospects occasionally but not not always but if you're in the nhl team sure, consistently sometimes you don't go out to the world juniors um so it's but for this because they're such a special line together i think they no matter what end up at the world juniors together but yeah i wouldn't surprise me if if will says to the sharks when if he signs yeah i i want to go to world juniors and the sharks will probably be like fine we want you yeah. to, we want we want to make sure he's for the Sharks, right, you you want to kind of give Will everything he wants because he's mm -hmm. NCAA, he has that power, right? You don't want to repeat the cutter go day yeah. situation. We've talked all about that. But once he signs, he's yours. <laughs> and yeah. so basically, give him everything he wants. He wants to go to Road Juniors. Hey, whatever. The Sharks are not going to be a great team again next year, probably. So it won't, probably won't matter. And so go mm -hmm. ahead. Go go have a good time. Uh, yep. But once he signs you know he, he he's, he's yours and so um uh, so that's that's the sharks what 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 you want to do you want to give the kid pretty much whatever he wants within reason get him to sign and then once he's in the sort of the rfa ecosystem he, he's he's yours so sharks could really use that <laughs> well just to, an offensive uh not force but like an offensive injection for next season even if it's you know he's gonna have a lot of struggles and things just would be a lot of fun to see. It is about how ready ready he is, and it did surprise me. Well, uh, yeah, uh, like I mentioned, what 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 these scouts were telling mm -hmm. me. Um, I watched him, and I thought he could use another year, and and he could he could spend the time. Also, uh, college there's more time to work out in season. But granted, mm -hmm. though, he's going to have a lot of time this summer to to work on that, yeah. and so maybe so maybe maybe he you has know, like I, I, yeah. He has improved like leaps and bounds this year, though. So I think that it was good to see because, I mean, he wasn't he was OK starting college. He still did some things. And then throughout the year, he became a dominant force. And mm -hmm. I, I think keep that trajectory up. Yeah, maybe he is NHL ready by the beginning of, you know, the season this year. So. um, All right. So moving on from some hopeful talk to some. <laughs> Let's talk about the game. Great talk. <laughs> Let's um, talk about what's going on in ice. <laughs> just to, we're not we're not going to go through each one because. <laughs> no, with dear Lord, we're not going to. Sad. <laughs> uh, but Sharks uh, lost They the should have lost that Seattle game uh, by. It was a good five, game, five, though. Five to two, but except for uh, Devin there, right? Um, That's an but... amazing game. Devin Cooley, uh, Sharks won uh, against Kraken 3-1. to one, Lost against the Wild 6-2. And then lost in a beer league game to the Edmonton Oilers nine to two. 
what was Purely the, for Cal- one team. What was the Calgary <laughs> score? Uh, let me look that up. Um, because- three two in overtime. Okay, so that oh that game was a little closer to because yeah, without without Cooley, like the last mm-hmm. three games uh, would have been like twenty to five or something. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God. I um I guess anyway, I, let's not let's not let's not talk too much about it. So uh <laughs> my only my only takeaway is yeah. it it really just from the very beginning, like he, you dropped the puck in Edmonton, you knew they were losing that game. Like it didn't even there was no yeah, they fight. Looked, they looked, they looked the horrific. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like I, I think that they're they're done with the season. I mean, they mm-hmm. they did give it basically maybe up to the Calgary game. They're like, okay, we're gonna try, we're gonna try, we're gonna try. Yeah. <laughs> and now they see the end, like, oh, you know, oh, hell yeah. Thank God. Can- Cancun is here. <laughs> you Thank know, God. They're, they're just like, go yeah, on vacation. It's, yeah, it's it's I I I yeah, I'll work my ass off for 78 games, more or less, work mm-hmm. my ass off, and we've won 19 games. Um, yep. I'm done with this. And so all yeah. of us are. We just yeah. uh, if you could find a lock of the century was the sharks losing that Edmonton game. Just McDavid <laughs> coming back needing a hundred points. It felt yeah. like it felt Got like it, it McDavid was like the best player in the world, not trying and only trying to pass the puck. It was hilarious. Cause like oh, watching yeah, him, yeah, yeah, he wasn't yeah. shooting. He was just like only trying to pass the puck. Yeah. It was what, what was it that uh, I think um, uh, Randy or Drew said uh, second period of the game. I've never seen Connor McDavid laughing on the bench. Yeah, He's during the laughing. second period of a game, and a JD uh, uh, from Locked On Sharks had a good joke too. He said something mm-hmm. like, "Oh, hey, Connor's coming back. Good, good preseason tune-up for him for the playoffs." Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what he was. Yeah, it was <laughs> stayed yeah. on the outside, stayed away from from, from getting hit, uh, dropped the dime, uh, scored the goal, and uh, there you go. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, and that's that's my biggest takeaway. That game was bad to watch, um, but yeah, it was like Alabama playing Middle Tennessee State um yeah in the ncaa <laughs> so uh other than that uh, and also no no shame to cooley like it felt like no every, they just kind of left him out there I they mean, left him out the dry and every think, sharks goalie has had that happen to them so far so against edmonton <laughs> yeah uh, we're just a, a team Edmonton is really just i mean i mean they're a bad matchup for every team but especially for the sharks i think obviously one of the sharks biggest problems that they needed to address mm-hmm. in some kind of micro way to at least uh um, in- incremental way not my incremental way no. is that they have uh they can't possess the puck and they can't kill plays they can't get the puck away from other teams and that's probably edmonton's greatest strength that they just hold on to the puck forever and mcdavid yep. just wheeling around the zone and, and and guys like that and so anyway um they're a particularly bad bad matchup for the sharks 100 <laughs> percent. there's and no so, chance yeah. um it was interesting about this game right before was the uh lineup decisions it was sure. um injured players that didn't travel were jan ruta mackenzie you Blackwood, see me doing that guy injured <laughs> injured in a hurt <laughs> um philip zadina <laughs> Uh, Jacob McDonald. Zadina might actually be hurt. Some of these guys might actually be hurt, but they're pretty minor injuries. A lot of them might not be. (laughs) A lot of them might not be, though, yeah. Barabanov and Hoffman. So it was like you take a bunch of of UFAs that, like, don't want to play for the Sharks anymore, and then you just kind of go. Well, the Sharks don't want them to play for them either, probably. Yeah. yeah, You're you're injured, wink, wink. Um, Yeah. That's what it felt like, at least. And we called up, and thankfully, we called up um, our goose boy, our goosh boy, uh, Daniel Gushin got some games in, or is getting some games in, and got yeah. a goal. Good for him. The funniest goal I've seen in Fuki a while. Fuki's goal. <laughs> goal. Um, and then Jack Thompson getting a, a cup of coffee, and Georgie Romanoff getting a, his first uh, NHL game in, which is great. Yeah. Um, want to mention with Jack Thompson, though, that that, that probably was Shakir Mukamadoulin's spot, but Mukamadoulin's mm-hmm. season... Um, they're just kind of being cautious with him. Uh, no need to, to to push it. He had a, a minor injury that uh, he's fully expected to recover from, and so yeah, and uh, rest him for the rest of the uh, the end of the season here, yeah. and then get him ready for off season training. Mm-hmm. So, um, and yeah, I I liked the way that Daniel played. It was uh, they lost nine to two, man. <laughs> yeah. It, it, <laughs> It's hard to find a positive, and he wasn't like he was a standout positive. It's just I, you know, was like we oh, he's uh, we actually asked Quinn specifically about the Neil today, yeah. just because we had yeah, asked no. about Jack and Georgie, and and David was just like, uh, yeah, yeah. He, uh, like eighteen other guys, he he had some work to do. <laughs> so so, it was so I, bad. yeah, so let's let's it not so let's bad. not get too excited about him. I mean, no, I know. 
Yeah. It wasn't like his um, a breakout game at all. I think Georgie, he, he had a Georgie, uh, or Georgie played well. <laughs> I think he did under I'll the circumstances. Give, give, under circumstances, I'll give him. He's that, getting so. the call up of the game for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at that point, it was like I don't know, pulling the wings off a fly or something. The way yeah. that the Sharks were playing them. Well, I do want to remind people, and I, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, um, that again, this is a reminder that if. Uh, your team runs out of its regular recalls after the trade deadline. You get four of them. The Sharks ran out of that when they uh, called up Stanika uh, mm-hmm. a couple a couple weeks ago. Um, and then uh, I, I do need to track back. Uh, they So they made a lot of moves right at the deadline. I believe it's because they they were still within sort of a shouting distance of the playoffs. So they wanted to make sure that mm-hmm. guys were available for the playoffs, guys like Bordalo and Cooley and just in case, uh, just yeah. in case. Um, but anyway... Not that big a deal, though, because you have this emergency recall system that no one takes seriously. And I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, and no one takes it seriously. LeBanc played the last game. He looked perfectly fine. Uh, who else will say they sit? Uh, Ruda, Ruda, Ruda came out and talked with us post game, and he told me his favorite burger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so he he was perfectly fine. Uh, Hoffman, I think, is healthy. Hoffman's been scratched a couple of games, but he's fine. McDonald practiced that morning. I saw him. Um, yeah. I don't know if he was totally healthy or whatever, but he practiced. Um, so he's probably close to fine, at least. Yeah. Uh, I think Barabanov might be hurt. I think Zadina might be hurt. And I, I think that might be about actually it for yeah. action. And, you know, they say everybody's hurt at this time of the season. So I'm sure, you know, I'm sure everybody's got something like, oh, yeah, my, my knee's kind of sore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. everyone's got something like that. Everyone's got aches and pains. But in terms of like, if this was these were meaningful games, who would be sitting out? Um, yeah, just a couple of those guys. But so anyway, um, so next year when this happens again, uh, just don't 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 worry too much. Uh, your guy's probably going to get a call up at some point if he's had a good yeah. season. So I'm waiting for the Ethan Cardwell call up. I thought maybe. Well, he'd get that's one in. that's yeah. I thought uh, he might too. But I mean, between if it's between Gushin and Cardwell, you give it to Cardwell just because he hasn't got it, but. Gushin has been a better player than Cardwell this season. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I think the fence was clearly between, it would have been between Mook Madulin and Thompson. And Mook Madulin obviously yeah. uh, was, was hurt. And I think the Sneka one, I think a big part of it that people underrate is that Sneka is an RFA. So they really need to make a decision on him and see yeah. if, if, if if he's changed his game enough that maybe he can come back as a 4C next, or as a, uh, uh, as a competition for, for a 4C spot next year or not. Um, whereas Cardwell and even Gushin, they have under control uh, yeah. for next year too. So, yeah, I um, you really want Sadiqa to like put up a point or like do something offensively? Oh. <laughs> I think he's been okay, honestly. He's like been I, okay, I watched but... him and he's looked okay. I think yeah. it's just he's not really doing much to to push play, um, offensively at least. Occasionally yeah. he'll make a good pass or. Um, it's got some speed that I think if, if Sturm is the model, I think Sturm is still ahead of him. Uh, granted, sure. Sturm is a few years older than him too, but yeah, um, like hundred percent. Um, yeah, but... so we'll see what they do with him. He's got yeah. a lot of decisions to make this off season. I'm actually kind of excited about that whole process. This off season is just the roster rebuild remodel kind of thing. I want to talk about that because like I, my initial thought is that there's not that many actual decisions to be made. Like they've already been made. Well, some <laughs> the, of them, the players, yeah. the players have made it. <laughs> some of them yeah but they're losing but, so many ufas that there's like these huge holes in the lineup of, nah, of guys true. and it's mostly we'll, we'll offense. Talk yeah, defense yeah. there isn't defense there's yeah. a lot of oh, like you know like a lot of guys that are signed for next year but forward wise there's the a defense lot of probably the area that they need to work on the most so, i know yeah, so it's kind of uh, yeah questionable about that yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> um okay uh you wanted to mention luke cunnan and some yes some, some charts I know like a lot of you guys are probably tired of Luke Cunning discourse. It's been a mm-hmm. lot of Luke Cunning talk the last couple of weeks on the podcast, uh, in the in the media too, because mm-hmm. Luke's had some good games, right? And I, I I I know these charts, and I don't look at I I'm aware of them in terms of like I have a sense of which players will look better on these kind of jfresh charts and uh these analytics charts and uh, i want to bring back again too that like i got into hockey writing i told a story before i wrote in one of the stories my stories last year that i got back into hockey or i got into hockey writing because of analytics because it gave me a window as a guy who never played a chance to um to kind of look beneath the hood and understand the game better yeah and so i have a lot of respect for it overall and 
uh i i i still look at it i support the major sites and i will use them from time to time but i think that i do think that um it's a very incomplete look at at the game and the players very very mm -hmm. incomplete and i think cunning is a very good example of this so uh uh a reader actually i uh, shout him out uh uh, and I think we used to write together at Fear the Fin. Uh, 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 Chion FTF is his Twitter handle. He sent me, uh, he sent me all of Cunnan's uh, uh, charts for the last few years. They're all very bad, and we we know this if you follow any of those things, right? He's not a guy who drives play. Um, mm. And I don't think there was there was ever any argument that he he did. I actually recall writing when the Sharks acquired him that like I thought that. He has some ability as a kind of a finisher on a bottom six line, not obviously a finisher like on the second line sure. uh, or even with William Macklin, right, necessarily, right? But like if he's like on your fourth line or even third line, he's sort of your shooter finisher on that line that he can do some good things. And um, I, I remember uh, actually from Sport Logic, there are stats that, that kind of showed that he's not great with a puck, though. He's not great in terms of neutral zone, in terms of just he's not great at kind of connecting plays. Yeah. And so that sort of makes him when he is on a power play, he's strictly a net front guy. He's not a guy you want along the wall connecting plays like a Grandlin or a Eklund or a Bordalo, right? And so these charts don't really uh, surprise me. Um, but anyway, uh, what I what I wanted to dig into was uh, how teams actually use these charts, right? And so I, I reached out to 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 a buddy of mine, um, uh, a team guy. And oh, I just pulled up his his answer. So okay. let, me, let me find it. Um, and obviously, I can't tell you the the team, um, but he says that for sure that teams are aware of these charts, or they have their own internal kind of similar uh, mm -hmm. similar metrics that they may have different results in some way or another. But uh, so so things like things like this are meaningful. Uh, so. So I want to say that up front, that things like this are meaningful. This this does show over a course of five years that Luke is not a guy that that drives play like uh, Eric Carlson, right? And of course, uh, I always ask people when they show me these charts, okay, what does this guy do that drives the play, right? Like literally on the ice, can you tell me what the guy does, right? And Eric Carlson, we can we can kind of guess, right? Um, he skates all around the place and, and can 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 get to those loose pots. Yeah. Um, he can uh, outskate outskate you to any pretty much any 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 puck on a blue line. Get to that puck first. Pinching, he's going to beat you to the puck there, and that's a big part of it, right? Obvious. So these are some of the things that that help him kind of drive uh, drive play, uh, drive possession, all those things, right? Joe Thornton's a classic example of a guy too. It's very obvious what he does uh, to to uh, to drive play. He just protects the puck all day long, right? Tommy Hurdle too, right? Similar, right? Guys that are strong in that department, right? Uh, Luke, like I mentioned, he's not great at connecting plays. Uh, that next play after he gets the puck, that next pass, sometimes he misses the basic ones. And so though these, th this is a problem for, 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 for driving play. If you turn it over uh, like on, on an entry, then you're not going to, you're not going to be helping with puck possession because the puck's going the other way. Right. Sure. And so these are things that, that Luke isn't great at. Right. But uh, this 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 person reminded me though once again this is what you guys have heard before but again it's a reminder that that these charts are not be all end all and that even a guy like a like a Luke Cunning brings a lot to the table that is valuable to teams yes. and maybe more valuable to some teams than others so so this is this is a, a point that this person made that yeah like like some teams may have a little more value for these charts than others but no one uses them as their be all end all no no angel team would uh because if he did that well you might also just hire uh evolving hockey and dre fresh and put him in your front office and <laughs> mm -hmm. save a lot of money right um so um so this is actually what the, what 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 this what this person said directly uh this executive said directly about luke that he brings uh and these are assets that people kind of uh kind of uh turn their nose up at or so or turn sure. their nose up at but he brings, uh, this is the quote, immeasurable assets, physicality, grit, character. And so I, I think, I, I think, I think on, on the balance, right, you have to, 
so these charts are meaningful, right? And these charts, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things these charts tell you is that Luke Cunning should not play on the second line. He shouldn't be on a skill line probably, right? But like if he's surrounded Luke on a, on a different team with, with better play drivers and he he's a complimentary part on the wing and he brings his skills and assets and also the fact too that he is kind of an all situations player. Again, power play is limited in that front, but he can kill penalties too. Um, and so that combines to, uh, to a player that has value. And so you can see why he has value around the league, mm -hmm. but anyway, though, um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, I think those they, charts uh... we looked at, I brought it to somebody, uh, on a team side to see what, what they thought of it. This person isn't with the sharks either. So just, just, if you're wondering on, on that point too. Sure. And I think, I think that's a, it's a fair take on it that, um, okay. So these, these charts matter, but, um, these players bring uh, other things that matter too. And if you, I guess if you want to kind of bridge kind of this, this argument, like, like I need to concede or, or people need to concede. Yes. These charts do matter. They do have some value, but the other side needs to concede too, that the things that you can't measure, um, that they, they matter a lot too. Um, mm -hmm. and you hear how a uh, William Eklund talks about a Luke Cunning, um, you hear a Mikhail Granlin, right? That how they gush about a Luke Cunning. And sure. so there is, there is value on that. Um, I think, um, the way that we've always, well, we've talked about players is always an archetypes. And if you're looking for that archetype, if you're looking for a high character, high physicality, grit, work hard penalty kill archetype Cunning's a great fit so it's it's best if you're you have a stanley cup contender where you have 12 guys that are you know all possession monsters and are um gonna push play all individually and also together but the sharks don't have that they're not even close so having these character guys just helps build a locker room that wants to work hard and that's all that's all you're doing i would even um, argue for like a winning team that you don't want 12 like similar-ish guys you need different yeah. elements right so if you put luke sure. on uh, line with two guys who, who better possess the puck and it's like a third or fourth line um might do okay it'd be perfectly fine yeah so yeah and, and, but, he, and luke will bring his elements that those guys can't the too. problem with the charts is they all they all have a very clear bias of what type of player rates at 100 percent, and that's the only player that fits on those charts like they they try with certain things like jay precious cards they try like here's the finishers here's the penalty killers etc cetera, etc cetera, to like mesh out offensive defensive contributions but it doesn't really fit in terms of what the modern day nhl is and players like kind of will consistently grade at zero percent but nhl gms will consistently want them on their team so right what, what mario is, is another example there is another like one that, right he has yeah. horrible charts i'm sure mm -hmm. from a few years um but nhl gms love them and they actually eventually when you get them on good teams meld with those good teams fine and make a good team great so yeah, I, I um I have some thoughts. I don't think that Conan is an, an amazing hockey player. I think he's but I think he's good enough in this team and a good addition to the locker room. And he also has some finishing talent, which I think the Sharks miss. So when it, those things kind of combine, I think he's worth it on the team. Not at three million dollars or whatever, but I'm not mad about Luke Cunning being on the team because he's the only one who seems to give a shit sometimes. <laughs> so like uh, you gotta, you have to weigh it out. That's a really bad hockey team. Try and find the guys that like are good in the room and want to be here. Um, yeah, but I think I would add to that too is I do think that Luke would be look better on a better team too. Um, I think that, so. I think yeah. in, in a lower yeah. role, a diminished. Yeah, role yeah, of course, team. of course, yeah. of course, yeah. So that's that's the the trade off. He's getting those horrible numbers when he has to play top six minutes most of the year. So. Well, he had those horrible numbers. Uh, look, to be fair, like uh, like Beforehand. those numbers weren't great on better teams and lower roles. And I, 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 I get all that. But again, those numbers, again, like if your argument starts and ends with these charts, then we're not going to have a discussion uh, about mm -hmm. it. And, and, and honestly, I don't think hockey people will take you seriously. If, if your conversation starts with these charts and then you will talk, listen about other things that a Luke does or a player like Luke does or a Mario does. Right. And we can have a conversation about it. Mm. Then, okay. Then, 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 then people will, will take it more seriously. But sure. yeah, again, you know, like sometimes people send me these charts, like I haven't seen them before. Like it's going to be like, Oh, argument over. It's not. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Let's move on to good news. Yes. <laughs> Sharks and Barracuda announced some awards. Are those? Um, is that good news? I don't know. That's good know. news. There's a couple of good names <laughs> but, on here. But, uh, let, let, let me let me let me let me take over here. Let sure, me run through uh, run through uh, my vote. Uh, Keegan uh, should get a vote. I'm gonna ask for him to get a vote next year. So I want to hear what, what Keegan's Keegan's takes on, on on some of these things. If he has has takes on mm -hmm. any of this, right? So. Um, so, okay, so for uh, Sharks, uh, let's go with the Sharks Awards and then the Barracuda one. So Sharks Player of the Year, uh, mm -hmm. all like everyone in the media, I think we all want Mikhail Granlin. has to be a, a current Shark, too, so it can't be like, oh, Thomas Turtle was so good in his first 48 games here that he <laughs> he he wins. It has to be a current Shark. So yeah. um, I would imagine you have no disagreement with Mikhail Granlin as uh, your Player of the Year. Uh, yeah, no disagreement. Mikhail okay. Granlin's the only one that... <laughs> Looks like he he belongs in whatever role that you're putting him in. So. Um, okay, so uh, rookie of the year, uh, mm -hmm. there was some disagreement here where uh, the media uh, picked Henry Thrun, but I went with Ty Emerson. Nice. And a reminder that a guy like William Eklund wasn't eligible because uh, he's played a couple of seasons. So technically he's not a rookie, like even the NHL eyes, he's not eligible for the Calder or mm -hmm. for like all rookie team voting. And sure. so the only guys eligible were Emerson, Thrun, Mukumadulin, Gushin, and Krona. <laughs> so really the bowl was between Emerson and Thrun because just a number of games. And I thought that Emerson, even though Emerson only played 20, 30 games, that he was marginally better than a Thrun. And I like Thrun a lot. Uh, I think everybody knows that, but anyway, yep. so I voted Emerson. Uh, what do you um, think? I think it's it's tough because I think if Emerson played the same amount of games, it's I think it's very clear Emerson. Okay. Um. So I, you might have gone Thrun then, just because he would stayed healthier. He stayed healthier, fair. and and he had like occasional offensive glimpses that sure. were a little bit like more. I don't know. They they gave me a little bit more hope. Um, mm -hmm. I like both as as good. Um lower in the lineup defenseman, I think, going forward. And they're both young, so I'm pretty excited about that. I, I think that Emerson, I see him as a really good, like, third-pairing defenseman, and I, mm -hmm. I'm really excited about him. So I, I would have gone with Thrun, okay. but I did, I liked Emerson ever since the pickup. I remember saying yeah, that. Yeah, you're, would, you're a big uh, Emerson him. guy, yep. Yeah, yep, yep. I, uh, I, I think he's got a really good defensive ceiling. Um, it's a, occasionally he makes some just dumbass plays with the puck that is needs to clean it up. He's a but, rookie, yeah, right. <laughs> he's yeah, a rookie. So he, he's only played thirty games. Uh, but defensively, he's games got career, yeah. he's got a good ceiling. He's got a great yeah. great skating for for what he does. And and there's a I think there's a third pairing defenseman there that's okay. that's going to go forward. So All right. I would have gone thrown, but it would have been close. Okay. Uh, media good guy. Uh, so actually, I'm curious uh, your perspective because uh, mm. uh, my perspective, you know, I, I'm in the in the room a lot at practices, and so I, I have a different perspective. But sure. you, uh, you're like you're you're on the outside of it, and so I wonder your perception from the outside, just watching like hmm. uh, a NBC press conference. Who seems like a media good guy to you, right? And just to remind everyone uh, what this award is, is it's uh, presented annually to the player who handles his media responsibilities with cooperation, honesty, and thoughtfulness, and answers the bell no matter the outcome and situation so yeah. uh, uh we one. we voted ferraro i voted ferraro but do you have a different uh, i like vote? i like nico sterns uh a lot because yeah, he, he's very right. he's very honest mm -hmm. um about the outlook of the team i think it's kind of cooled off a little like he hasn't given like the scathing reviews he did i think at the end of last year <laughs> well i remember the beginning, uh, of, the beginning of, of of last season the islanders mm -hmm. is still considered uh uh the sharks i think they will start a season oh zero and five and nico yep. nico's just coming off stanley cup with colorado yeah and um he just went to town and i don't yeah. want to take too much time with it but uh sure. there was an islanders media person next to me who was recording he said that is the best player ability availability that i've ever been around <laughs> i mean he's honest and that's part yeah. of the uh part of yeah. the criteria is honesty right. and thoughtfulness and right. he's very honest um but i, I think ferrario makes a lot of sense just because he uh he um seems like he's he's always got not always got an availability but he he, he always has to <laughs> yeah because yeah. We, we lean toward the 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 the, the leadership the yeah. guys with the A's and the C's uh, after uh, these tough losses because, yeah, I mean. Yeah, I, I like Ferraro's too. And he always yeah, seems Ferraro's to um, take it on his sleeve a little bit. And uh, he wants to win. He just mm -hmm. it hasn't happened yet for him, sadly. Okay. Uh, Sharks prospect of the year. And we don't vote on this. This is mm -hmm. internal with the Sharks. But I think the way that they measure this too is the Shark prospect that had the best year kind of contained within his 
his uh, ecosystem. Like last year, yeah. Ethan Cardwell won prospect of the year, right? And it's yeah. not because Ethan Cardwell is considered the best prospect of the shark system. I think back then, last year, Eklund was still a prospect. So Eklund would have been, uh, for everybody, a better NHL prospect. But uh, Cardwell last year, within his ecosystem, within his yeah. uh, OHL season, right, had an incredible season. I think he had like 95 points and whatever, yeah. right? So that's, that's how they measure it, I believe. And so anyway, uh, their vote was uh, also the Sharks' best prospect anyway, uh, but yeah. Will Smith, which is hard to argue against that because 71 be. points, national championship, uh, made the national championship game. Uh, so basically with like the- yeah, And the, World Juniors as well. Yeah, he World Juniors like, oh, good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah so so, so no no, no contest there probably, right? Not for me. I, th- I mean, yeah. Musty was, would be the other one, but- Yeah, but um, he wasn't in World Juniors. Wasn't it World Juniors? And I think when you're looking at just the level of competition and and their play, it's still got to be Will Smith. Mm, okay, okay. Uh, that's those are the Sharks awards. Let's run through the Barracuda awards really quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. I only vote on one of these, and uh, it's a prospect of the year. And uh, for this award, we're asked to only vote for Barracuda players still on their ELC. Sure. And the media voted for Shakir Mukum Abdullah, which is a good choice. But I went with Gushin myself because I thought that well, Gushin is 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 a, a year more experience in the AHL than Mukum Abdullah, and so they sure. ended up at about the same number of games played. They both had really good seasons. They were both All Stars. Granted, Gushin was All Star at first, and then Mukum Abdullah was sort of his uh, replacement in some way, injury replacement. But uh, but I thought that Gushin was kind of more consistently dominating in his minutes, so that's why yeah. I gave it to Gushin. Anyway, uh, what do you think? Yeah, you know what I'm going to answer. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Love the goose. It's still going to be goose. He scored hey, one uh, goal yesterday, and you had, you had, you had to shout out his, his performance yesterday. About so. the one goal. Uh, it's still going to be goose. And <laughs> I, um, I think he's still, and we're going to probably see it in this last game here, still needs time before he's in the NHL, I think, yeah. consistently. But um, yeah, just he he was the, the guy for the Barracuda. Like, the guy every night trying to the one who's going to give you points, the one who's going to play first line power, I'm leaving its first yep. line. And uh, with the, with a pretty, I'll say bereft offensive team bereft. Is that the right word? I don't yes. Know. Yeah. That that's, sounds that's like the right fair. word. Uh, but not as skilled as like last year where you had um, Bordalo and Eklund and all that stuff. So I don't know. I, I, um, I would go with goose, but it's close. Okay. And then uh, a few more. And then yeah, let's run through it to, quickly mm-hmm. and just see if you have any, any, any thoughts of it. Uh, player of the year was, uh, was Mukuma Dulin, which I thought was interesting. I don't know how they vote. This is a this is from the Barracuda because sure. the player of the year is I uh, might I mean I don't know Mukuma Dulin is a defenseman and so he does play big minutes. So there could be something to that. But I mean I think then you can start bringing in guys like uh, Nathan Todd or yeah. Nathan uh, or Gushin, right? Um, but anyway, the rookie of the year was Ethan Cardwell, which I think is a pretty uh, pretty solid choice. I don't know Mukuma Dulin, I guess isn't considered a rookie, but. He, yeah, he, he has played HL games before. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, so maybe that's why. Um, but anyway, uh, most inspirational player was Scott Sabrin. Hard hat mm-hmm. award went to Anthony Vincent. That's sort of like the, the yeah. hardest working player on the ice. And then man of the year, this community award is uh, Cardwell. Great. I mean, I got no qualms with any of them, really. Yeah. I just wish Goosh got out, would have got one award, but he did get the all star <laughs> game. So I think he's they... in it. No, that's his, that's his award, all right? He's, he's his first DM just went up like 10 times. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, his for sure. DM, uh, went, just went up exponentially. So that's yeah. his that's his reward. Uh, so we want to cl- close off with just a quick uh, thoughts about uh, Philip Beestead. I watched mm-hmm. him live the last three games. I wrote a story about about Philip, and I have to say that I was not impressed at all at the first home game that, that, uh, that I watched. I think it was Henderson. It was the 6-5, 6-5. Uh, uh, actually, uh, Carwell scored the game winner 6-5 victory over the mm-hmm. silver knights uh was not impressed uh, uh, uh with him in that game i thought that his pace was poor he was being caught with the puck a lot but what i did like is that post game he kind of knew it i asked him what he thought he could improve in his game from the henderson game henderson game and he said a lot mm-hmm. and i think that what i also liked is that he did that the next two games against texas so if you watch those next two games against texas um i think that there was a lot of improvement improvement with his pace uh making skill plays and not all of them are the ones that resulted in points for him so just uh kind of subtle passes There's a lot of tools there i don't think he's close to ready to nhl unless he has an incredible summer based on what i've seen uh on you know watching nhl live when they've been on the road watching yep. him at home 
I don't think he's close to the NHL in, in, in any sort of way. Uh, mm. But um, I think there's a lot of tools there. Smooth skater, big. Uh, once he learns to use that size, uh, there was a clip that uh, I added to my story of an example of him using his size, using the body first instead of uh, just reaching for the puck with his stick, right? And obviously that reach of his is a weapon too because he's 6'4". But a guy that that big though you want him to use his size first uh use his body first and so hopefully he obviously needs to add some strength but uh hopefully when he does that he doesn't lose any of his speed his skating but mm -hmm. there are a bundle of tools there and so i think that it's actually came out of all of that uh the ups and downs of of, of watching those games actually pretty excited by by the, by the package that, that that he's shown and um you know i know the stats look pretty good he's got uh, three goals and three assists in uh, six games not I don't know. I don't. Yeah, not too bad at all. I don't know if uh, I would expect him to be a point per mm -hmm. game player, even in AH, AHL next year, because that's a pretty tough thing to do. I mean, uh, a guy like Gushin, right, did, didn't do that until his second year, right? So I wouldn't necessarily expect that out of Beastead. I think he's kind of off to a hot start. He's got some bounces here and there too, right? But overall, though, I, I do, I do like all, all, all the tool, the tools that I've seen. And um, he also had an interesting answer too when I asked him about his struggles this season, which you can find in the, in in the article. Uh, but um, yeah, he he just kind of mentioned that he thought that a lot of things in his game improved. And mm. he is a guy too that I do wonder uh, to close off that I th I think he might be a guy if he can embrace the physical side of the NHL that he might flourish more in the NHL because uh, because he's going to be able to use his size to sort of greater authority here if he you know if he if he plays like he means it yeah. uh, and so I, I think there's there's a there's really a lot to work with there so I, I came out of it um, obviously like everybody you saw his numbers this year it's like oh you know they take kind of a step back right but from what I saw the Barracuda um, this, this this stretcher I would say that there's a lot to be excited about that I'm not too worried about whatever happened mm -hmm. this year in Sweden I mean remember what happened with uh, Eklund right after the Sharks sent him back uh, in his uh, in his uh, D plus one year, and I know this is B sets D plus two, but uh, yeah. after after they sent him back, uh, and he was it was a disaster in Sweden for a lot of reasons, right? Yeah. And um, anyway, so I, a lot of a lot of good tools here, and so if it comes together, the Sharks will will have uh, made a very good pick there, and he should be a very good player. I love it. Yeah, it's a. I think it's a, a little bit. We don't got too too much time, so we're gonna sign off yeah. here in a second, but. Yeah, it's a little bit of consistency issues and a little bit of when he hits his highs, he actually looks really good. Mm -hmm. And then yes. when he hits I mean, the lows, I can see that even with the Barracuda. Yeah. Yeah. When he hits the lows, he 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 looks a little lost, I think, is, is kind of, especially offensively. Um, yeah. And then it's a little deer in the headlights still. Yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. not, you know, sure. Of the pace, and physicality, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Mook Madulin did that for, for a while. Mm. Um, before good he model. Put it together. Yeah. But it's the same kind of thing. Like, that's the kind of player that once he does put it all together, there is. Like an NHL or there, so she's mm. got to be patient with him. I think he's going to need the AHL yeah. next year for sure, for sure, um, to, for sure. to mold him. But uh, all right, guys. oh, same with Graf too. I know it's a, a side, but people penciling Graf in the lineup. Yeah, mm, I think he needs uh, more time it, too. He, he needs it too. Yeah, unless he has an, again a credible summer. I don't want to put it past people, but yeah. But anyway, mm -hmm. anyway, guys, um, enjoy the Greg interview. It's great. Greg's a great guest. Hopefully, we're gonna yes. have him on uh, next year as well. Um, and again, reminder that this was recorded before the whole Arizona Salt Lake City thing. So we, we yeah, talked about it a little. But... April 5th. Yeah, we mm -hmm. actually are amazingly uh, uh, prescient. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were like, there's no way this is going to happen. The NHL is going to move. Well, let's make jokes about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it did <laughs> within a week. Um, anyway, so uh, I hope you guys enjoy it and we will see you next week. Today, we have a man who needs no introduction in the hockey world, <laughs> senior angel writer of, e of ESPN, Mr. Puck Daddy himself, and Mike Greer's number one fan, Greg Wyshynski. Welcome to the show, man. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've come to learn that my effusive praise of Mike Greer as GM of the year has, uh, has made me a known quantity around the San Jose Sharks team. Uh, which is uh, it, which is interesting. I, you know, I clear, clearly haven't had that, that level of impact around the Sharks since I lived out in California. Uh, so it's good to be back in their good graces, uh, praising their GM for the work that he's done. <laughs> I think they're looking for praise anywhere they can get it. So. Yeah, oh yeah, right. no, we want we want some good news for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so going back, if you guys uh, haven't listened to it, on the March 27th episode of the Jeff Merrick Show, uh, Greg made a case for Mike Greer, uh, GM of the 32nd ranked 
of 32 teams <laughs> of, in the NHL, uh, GM of that team as GM of the year. And what was your case? My, my case was simply that the, the award... It, Okay, so let's rewind for a second. I'm a strict constructionist when it comes to NHL awards, as anyone who's read me talk about the Hart Trophy knows. Like, I am someone who believes the criteria for the award is is uh, is to be accepted on its own terms, and then and then you you can add your own little wiggle room to it if you want. But as far as the description of the GM of the Year award, the Jim Gregory GM of the Award, which I mm -hmm. I think we can go like Lula Amarillo or, or someone else for that one, but um, is that it is for the, like basically the GM that does his job the best. Mm. There's nothing in there about success. There's nothing in there about winning playoff rounds. There's nothing in there about winning the Stanley cup. It's just like, who's done the most effective job as GM. And I say this in all sincerity, the, the job that Mike Greer had this year was get rid of some of these contracts that are no longer tenable for the sharks mm -hmm. and their rebuild and, and take that money off their cap and be as terrible as possible in order to secure the best lottery odds and get this team, Macklin Celebrini to, you know, transition to the next phase of the franchise or, you know, as other, as other people have pointed out, you know, one of the top two or three picks. Right. Um, and so in doing, he's accomplished all of that. Uh, he's gotten rid of contracts, uh, you know, with the hurdle trade and, and, uh, and, he, and he, you know, obviously stretching back to last summer, the Carlson trade. And the, the team is terrible. Uh, I mean, the, the goal differential of. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's I, I've seen him play. I mean, I, I do have some idea, but like the, the goal differential. Not being, every night. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I'm sure it's soul sucking. But like the goal differential climbing close to like 150 on the negative side is pretty impressive. Yep. Um, granted, like he's probably been too good at his job because the team shouldn't be this bad. But right. listen, man, when your task is to tank. And I'll go ahead and use the T word. When your task is to tank, 100%. then I don't know. He's done great. He's done better than <laughs> Kyle Davidson did last year uh, with the Blackhawks. Like, he's done great. And and so my argument is, is that, you know, when when, you're, when your job is to win a, a playoff round and you do that, you get all the credit in the world. When your job is to uh, just qualify for the playoffs and you do that, you get all the credit in the world. If your job is to be this bad, and 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 make the deals that he's made to to get rid of some of the contracts that were a albatross on their cap for a team that isn't going to be competitive for at least three years. I think he's done a great job. I think he's done a a as good at that as I've seen a GM do at any of the other things they were tasked to do this year. Well, uh, Greg, uh, we uh, pretty much agree with you. So, Mike, if you're listening, this is a safe space for you. This is, <laughs> is going to be the safest space maybe uh, in the next uh, year or so for you, this uh, this this uh, upcoming uh, 20 minutes or so of our interview. But got to say, uh, that chump uh, uh, Kyle Davidson still has Seth Jones on the book. So I think Mike would have <laughs> well, I mean, you know, listen, divested himself of, of Seth the, Jones pretty quickly. So <laughs> The only flaw in my argument, the only black mark on, on, on his, his report card is that he had to use up all three of this of the of the salary retention sure. spaces and that obviously uh keeps them from being able to um keep keep salary on a logan couture trade sure for example i mean there there are ways around it you can still you know trade out assets to have another team help facilitate something but to have to you to have had used those three spots um I, I think is the only thing that I, I, I was sort of like yeah. a little unimpressed by. And then, you know, you get into the whole, like the return for these trades. I mean, sure. it all remains to be seen. I, I think it's, it's pretty obvious the return on the Meyer trade was okay so far. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll see how everything else shakes out. But like um, the, the, the important thing for him was to remove those players from the cap. It wasn't necessarily to get a, a windfall, of yeah. prospects and picks back the other way because he wasn't going to. Yeah, and think... we'll, we'll ask you about the a couple of these specific trades in a little bit, but I did want to point out too that uh, it speaks to how bad a situation that he inherited. So this again is not my career situation. Right. And so yeah. they are using retention spots on Brent Burns, Eric Carlson, on uh, Tommy Hurdle. 
Um, the NHL gave them a gift, uh, getting rid of the Vander Kane contract. They bought out <laughs> yeah. Martin Jones. And they yeah. still, after all this, five contracts you know, uh, uh, that, that they've been able to get rid of, they still have Logan Couture and Mark Edward Vlasic on the books. That's that's how bad a situation he inherited. So I wanted to, yeah. to, uh, to note that, but yeah. anyway, mm-hmm. though, um, a big part of your, uh, your argument for Mike as GM of the year is that the sharks win the number one, uh, pick in the draft lottery that's upcoming in May. And anyway, if the sharks do not win that number one pick, uh, do you think that uh, hurts uh, Mike's uh, candidacy in your eyes? <laughs> Well, he's going to get a pretty good player at two. I mean, there's a yep. foundational defenseman at two um, that, that people think could, could easily be somebody that you, you can build a winner around. Um, but obviously like all of this is in service of trying to get Macklin Celebrini, not only because I think that he is going to be a, a very good NHL player, a star player, a franchise player, if not generational talent as is kind of the sense that I get from the, the scouts and the insiders that yeah. I've spoken to about him. Um, but he's a name and, and, and more than, than the name he is a marketing tool for a franchise that has to find some way to re-energize this fan base and get people back in the arena and get butts in seats and, and give sharks fans a sense of like, yeah, the, the Thornton Marlowe years, they are a distant memory at this point, but here's Macklin Celebrini and we've got Eklund here and we've got some other things, the other, you know, irons on the fire and the, the future is bright. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that, um, of course, he's also the son of uh, Rick Celebrini, who uh, works for the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. And I know that the Sharks have a Warriors night. I'm pretty sure the Warriors don't have a Sharks night. (laughs) 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 Not that the Warriors need a Sharks night, but if you have the son of one of your uh, uh, most important uh, sort of uh, uh, of, uh, employees or behind the scenes people, physiotherapists, right? Maybe the Sharks will be uh, uh, get get merited up to a, mm-hmm. uh, a a Sharks night at Warriors. Which is uh, speaking to your point, great PR. So yeah, mm-hmm. and and that 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 connection with his dad is really interesting. I wrote about uh, Celebrini recently in, in the context of the BUBC rivalry, which could be a collision course situation in the Frozen Four right now, where I mean the BC's coach said, "Look, this is." Alabama, Auburn, or Ohio oh, State, yeah. Michigan for college hockey, this BCBU thing. So it'd be really cool to see him play for the championship. Um, he, his exposure to all of these elite athletes growing up, you know, be it Steph Curry, Draymond Green, like be, be it the hockey players, mm-hmm. like the Sedins that his father worked with. Like sure. it's, it, it is, it is incredible to think about like the examples that have been set for this kid that have clearly imprinted on him to be the, athlete that he is and the hard worker that he is i i had his coach tell me that like the the great thing about him is that even as a freshman you know he's the guy who sets the tempo in practice he's the guy that pushes everybody else on that bu team and and that's it's really cool to see and you know exactly where it comes from mm-hmm. what would you um what would you put the sharks like deservo meter for number one at would you put them as like the number one deserve it the most kind of thing yeah, the guys, uh, teams around there, uh, Anaheim, Columbia, same teams as last year, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually, the only other team that's going to be, is going to have decent lottery odds that I think is as high as the Sharks on the Deservo meter is Arizona, only mm. because they've never won the lottery. Sure. You know, and, and, and so, you know, the Sharks obviously have had really good players over the years. They've had playoff success over the years. Um they 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 deserve Macklin Celebrini because they are a franchise in peril right now as far as like, <laughs> trying true. to you know get people to get interested in this team again. And and I, I I've made the argument um the other day that the, the Sharks are an important team to be good. Yeah, I think like, so. You, you think about how the the Battle of California has atrophied. You know you know those those Sharks Kings matchups were were must see TV for a long time, and I still mm-hmm. think it could be that way. Sharks Knights. I mean, we barely got. Um, but at like a year or two of that rivalry. So I think it's important that they get good again, um, not only for the, for the franchise locally, but the NHL nationally. So th- they're number one for me, but number two is, is Arizona simply be- just because of like, they've never won the lottery. And then, and then obviously like if they do end up staying there, um, you, you could use a Macklin Celebrini as kind of a, a hook to try yeah. to get people into a new building in 2027, which is, their current plan, we'll see if it comes to fruition or or if he ends up playing in Salt Lake City. 
Yeah, we uh we had a conversation off the air just before you came on about the land auction is the day before the draft. So <laughs> yeah, so I saw that. I saw what? that. It's it's crazy, right? So um, do you the the permutations here? You win it or you don't win it. You get the lottery. You don't get the lottery. It's it's nuts to me what could happen with Arizona right now. Yeah, I mean they're they're bullish on on being able to win that land auction. Like they think that mm -hmm. it's going to happen. They. They clearly have, you know, they're comfortable enough to release the plans for the arena and the, and the entertainment district they're looking to build. But I asked their their team president, Javier Gutierrez, um, for the story that published this week on on the Coyotes and their arena. Like, is there a scenario in which you go through all of this and the NHL still says, nah, we're good. You're going to move to Salt Lake City. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't have an answer for it. Oh, no. <laughs> And I, I got, I got, I got, I got crap from Coyotes fans for asking the question. And listen, I just ask questions, man. I don't have any. I'm like the Joker. Sure. Like, I don't have any rhyme or reason for the, <laughs> that pops into my head. But like, if his answer is I don't know, I think that's it, not a good. I think that's more newsworthy than my question. Yeah. So who, be... who the hell even knows what'll happen with this team yeah. in the next few months? I, I think th they are very optimistic that they've found a solution. Um, not only that it'll, that'll appease the NHL and the NHLPA, but mm -hmm. that more importantly doesn't require any public vote uh, yeah. or a lot of public money, and and so they think they think they've got this thing figured out. But but again, the 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 other wrinkle of this is, and 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 I think part of the motivation to me asking that question was, um, you know, to do this project is to stay at Mullet Arena for another like three years, mm -hmm. and and that's really the problem right now for Marty Walsh and the NHLPA is like you've got this team that continues to play in a college arena, and and uh, is that is that tenable? Um, so we'll see we'll see what happens there. Obviously, it all comes down to whether or not they win that that auction. Well, yeah, I love the, the potential of the uh, Macklin SLC uh, Brini era. So. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. See, that's okay. really funny. I like that. SL, 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 SL Thank you. you go ahead and use it. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a little. It's a little messy. Need some workshopping, but it's yeah. Fun. Yeah, it does. It does. But it's, I think it's pretty good. Uh, out, out of out of the thin air here, right? So, yeah. I mean, it's 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 probably not as good for some some people that want to hear like Quebeclin or something Quebec like that. But uh, that works too. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah. The the it'd be very strange for the NHL to carry the water for Arizona for like however long. And then you're on like the one yard line and then just go, yeah, <laughs> you gotta go. It, it would be really weird. But we but tried. again, like th this whole situation is weird. My, my, th I'd love to be able to ask Gary Bettman like one mm -hmm. day, um, if he, if he took my calls, uh, about, uh, <laughs> whether, talks. whether or not he believe like they clearly want a team in Phoenix. They want a mm -hmm. team in Arizona. Like that's, that's fine. That's a huge TV market. Sure. And if they ever can figure it out there, I think a team there would do really, really well. There's a lot of money there. There's a lot of hockey fans there. Sure. Um, my question to him would be, is the Coyotes brand too toxic mm. that you'll never be able to really maximize the potential for a team there? Because, I, I, I mean, the, the, the whole tax issue uh, is probably the biggest reason the Tempe Arena vote failed. But it's also, these are the Coyotes, the team that didn't pay their bills in Glendale, and we don't trust them. And that, that was a part of it too. And I wonder if there's a certain toxicity around the franchise that's unavoidable right now, given their history, that um, you might be better off moving them to SLC and then bringing in an expansion team there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd have to get him to answer your call and also to give you a straight answer that isn't just we believe in hockey in Arizona. <laughs> so there's two <laughs> obstacles for you there. <laughs> I mean, I, I I mean, in bet to Batman's credit, like I mean, he, he hasn't gone full Marty Walsh on, on criticism of Arizona, but it's clear that the mm -hmm. league's uh, you know, tone and tenor about that situation has changed a mm. bit in the last sure. year. For like sure. they sent out a very kind of like snippy uh a, 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 a statement after the Tempe boat failed about like their level of disappointment and, and, you know, kind of indicating time to waste and as far as trying to find a solution there. So there, I mean, to his credit, I don't think he's nearly as, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, sunny about the, the, the whole deal as he was maybe like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, uh, uh, bring it back to the, to the sharks here and wanted to ask you sort of about the, um, one of the big reasons why I wanted to have you on Greg is just from from our corner of, of the of the NHL first, it seems like like uh, people are very down on the Sharks rebuild. A lot of media people and that sort of thing, right? And the reason we think might be the case is that the national perception of the Sharks rebuild seems to 
conflate the end of the Doug Wilson era. That's you know three years of that, right? And also they were not in a rebuild. I mean, they they resigned Tom Osh Hurdle in 2020, March 2022. That's not a team in a rebuild. Um, with uh, what Mike Greer has done since the summer of 2022 when he was hired. So in, in our minds, the clear rebuild doesn't start when you when you uh, when you start missing the playoffs. That's not when the rebuild starts. A rebuild starts in the summer of 2022 when Mike trades uh, Brent Burns. Anyway, what do you think of just sort of that that national uh, perception of just what where the Sharks are going here? Well, I think a lot of the national perception comes from just how bad they are. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in in some cases a rebuild gives you multiple levels of hope. I mean, you look at the Ducks right now, like as bad as they are, you can still point to, you know, McTavish and and, and Zegris when he's healthy mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what, what, uh, what, uh, you know, Carlson's going to turn out to be for them. And like, you, you could say, okay, they've got some, some things cooking there. I, I don't think there's enough attention given to the Sharks to really understand their, what their prospect base is right now. Um, and that like a kid like Will Smith could be a hugely impactful player for them when he comes out of college. And, um, and also just like how bad they are. I think it's hard to really square where the rebuild is when the, the team is this this terrible. And, and you know, when you see, when a local writer sees their team play the Sharks and sees the Sharks lose 7-1, it's like, all right, well. This... And there's 7,000 people in the tank. Yeah, and there's 7,000 yeah. people there. You're just like, you're like, oh, that's going to take forever. Um, but again, like, you know, if there was more attention paid to the idea that they've got, um, you know, seven, I think it's like seven picks in the first two rounds over the next two years, a number of them first round picks. Um, you know, they, 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 they clearly are, um, you know, doing some good things in the rebuild and, and then it's just going to be a matter of, of draft lottery luck. And then, and then hitting on some of these, these, uh, these high draft picks that they have to, to make it, make all these trades have been worthwhile. And we want to get to that in the end, uh, all the picks that the sharks have coming up, that sounds all great on paper, but we want to ask, uh, ask you in a little bit, uh, just uh, so everybody listening, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, wait, wait for it. But want to ask you about how, how the Sharks employed the Athena build uh, teams like the Oilers uh, back in the 2010s, the Sabres now, the Senators. But anyway, we'll get to that in a little bit. But before we get to that, though, I want to ask you specifically about the Tomas Hurdle trade. And a lot of people, um, th there's also a perception that the Sharks maybe could have done better to there. <laughs> but personally, and, you know, maybe this is this is this is me, uh, uh, you know, wearing my my teal glasses here and whatnot right but i i don't know if if if, if you can get better than two first round picks for a 30 something player with six years left on his contract uh with uh, injury history and if you look back and maybe you can correct me here and i haven't done my full research but i i can't see any players in the past that with this all these caveats 30 something a lot of contract left, right? That got a lot back in a trade. The only one that stood out to me, obviously, when I did a quick look was um, Pete, oh, was uh, Shea Weber. But two of the caveats there is, number one, Shea Weber was an elite, elite player. Thomas Hurdle is just a very, very good player. He's not yeah. a Norris Trophy kind of guy. And number two, uh, P.K. Subban, who they got back, was equal, like kind of equal money. So the, right. uh, um, yeah, so so I, I just, so I for what Hurdle was in terms of everything in context, I understand the player that hurdle is right now, just as a pure player, of course he's worth more than two. You presume two late first round picks, but you, you can't just judge it based on that. Obviously, with with the contract contractual situation, so I I thought they did great. Well, it's less it's it's for me less about his his contract and and more about the ne the necessity of getting rid of his contract. Like mm -hmm. let, let's not pretend that there hasn't been an edict from ownership to to decrease payroll. I mean, like, look at all the trades they've made and, and the aggressiveness behind those trades. Like, they clearly are trying to make this thing lighter as they get into a rebuild. I mean, that's it's obvious. Um, so so that being established, it's not as if Mike Greer is dealing from a position of power. It's not as if people are being like, oh, he doesn't want to get rid of Thomas Schroeder. Well, of course he does. He wants to get rid of that contract. Um, they're re a rebuilding team. He has no value to them during a rebuild. All he does is make them better and they want to be as bad as possible. So, so from that, from that being established, you know, already you're dealing from, from a, a position of weakness if you're Mike Rear. And then, you know, who knows what, what, what Edstrom ends up being. I mean, like you called him a first rounder. He's basically like a high second rounder with where he went in the first round. Um, you know, he's, he's a, he's a Swedish kid. We don't know what he's going to end up being in this league. Uh, and then you actually have another first rounder that you can kind of play around with. So uh, listen, like you said, it, it's, it's a pretty good return for a player that he was looking to trade. And, um, and, and we don't, 
really know what the market is for a player of his age, uh, his injury history, and his contract. Yeah, and I wonder about in terms of just uh, you know just getting in in the in the weeds here a little bit, but um, I don't know if how much of it was ownership telling telling Mike to to get rid of this specific player. I think a big part of it, and that could have been a case, but the other weakness uh, in terms of like the kind of positional weakness that Mike was in, Tommy wanted out. You know, when Tom, when when Hurdle resigned uh, with the Sharks, that wasn't for a rebuild. That was under a different no, regime. Wasn't. Yeah, that I believe promised him something. I don't know this specifically, but I know he did not sign for a rebuild. And he took the first kind of re like ticket out the door, basically, <laughs> like in terms of, uh, OK, <laughs> or do we, you know, <laughs> Vegas, the Sharks fans will hate me. No problem. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think that's I mean, I, I, you guys would know better than I, but that would would seem to probably track as well as far as like for all sure. those guys. I mean, I'm sure Couture is in the same boat, right, as far as yeah. not wanting to be there during a. Uh, uh, years mm -hmm. in which they give up uh, negative 133 goals <laughs> on the season. So, um, Logan, but, if you uh, stay uh, here, you can get us on. You can get us in the negative double digits. Does that sound good to you? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the idea of financial streamlining, streamlining for a rebuilding team is not an alien concept. Oh, sure. I mean, it, you know, especially when you when you think about the revenue that's not coming in for this team at this point that mm -hmm. had been coming in previously, and and how that probably affects the bottom line. Yeah, I think it's just smart, and it seems like a there's a lot of like hand wringing about, you know, oh, the, the contract slots and, and everything, but nobody's trading for Vlasic anyway. So even retaining half on Vlasic right. doesn't matter. Kurt just right. was injured the entire year this year. So nobody's trading for him this summer either. Right. So like we need another year to see even if Couture is going to get back to his old form anyway. I'm really so I bummed. Think... I, I really thought there was a, there was an angle where he could have ended up being kind of like what Middlestad ended up being for Colorado. Like I really oh, thought yeah. that like yeah. Yeah. playing behind McKinnon, I know there had been maybe some talk about that last season too, but mm -hmm. like I thought that would have been a, a perfect fit for them and a perfect fit for, for Logan if he was healthy. Yeah, uh, that last retention spot the Sharks had uh, before they traded Hurdle, uh, we had talked about on a podcast that it was like uh, it was like uh, the Dark Knight when the when the when the Joker uh, breaks the the pool stick and says, "Hey, it's a competition here, tryouts." Basically, that was like the Hunger Games for the last spot between Hurdle and Couture. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but um, you know, sure is like a so a great playoff warrior. Obviously, teams would value him if he's healthy so I, I just don't think there's a world where i think greer looked at it too it was like i have one more slot open after next summer so maybe i could trade him next summer instead of this one if yeah. he gets healthy but yeah it's a possibility yeah it, it just kind of bothers me because people will always just look at the, those that specific thing the the retention slots and be like well greer's doing a crap job and it's like no you, you got to go a little deeper i think there's like some nuance here of what he's doing but yeah anyways maybe the only one the only, the only one that's a bummer was the burns one like burns yeah, yeah. i mean listen Looking i know i know the cap hit was the cap hit but that's a guy that probably you Could've know more. You, he he might have even had more value than hurdle at that point as mm -hmm. far as like his tradability um as like yeah. a number one defenseman but i don't know well it, 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 it like you said price price of doing business yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I remember back then that uh, when the trade happened that um, I don't know if the because I think Burns has really kind of reclaimed his reputation more in Carolina that had fallen a little bit in San Jose. And uh, it was a question of, you know, well, is it a team dragging Burns down more? And we he's answered in Carolina that, yeah, it was sort of the team dragging him <laughs> down. Uh, but that, you know, he wasn't quite the Brent Burns of the past, which I don't think he was, which is, you know, like the Brent Burns of the past would have maybe been able to do a little bit more to carry the Sharks. That's no uh, ding on him. You know, he's in his yeah. uh, late 30s. But, but, uh, I, but the return yeah, was, was light, though. You know, if we compare it to Eric Carlson getting, even though he had to take on his contract it's still first round pick you mm -hmm. get back yeah. obviously hurdle got back a decent return a team Omar being a much younger player got back a much better return and you look at the burns trade and you look at well yeah maybe they should have he also wanted out so let's be clear about that and you know he has he had given the sharks so much that like for sure like he's a guy that you you give him uh you know he also had a three team trade clause so he got to pick where he wanted to go to so he had control in that way but maybe they should have held him a little bit longer into the season and maybe they could have got got more yeah so i i do give you that for sure that the return does end up being light for for him yeah yeah but it's and then it, but and again like you said it's probably the numbers atrophied because the sharks were bad and then there was also the whole eric carlson of it all yeah and uh you know <laughs> we all know that there were reasons why he wanted to leave <laughs> yeah
What was your um, opinion on the Meyer trade when it went down? Because you are a Jersey fan, a New Jersey fan. Well, and has that I, it's changed funny. We were just talking about like the value of players. Like Myers is probably, I, I probably misspoke. Myers is probably the highest of, of mm-hmm. anybody they traded just sure. because there was a, a derby for him. There was definitely teams that were involved that, that wanted to sign him long term. And yeah. I, I remember thinking at the time that uh, it wasn't like the greatest return from, from the devil's perspective. I mean, thinking about the number of, of real tippy top young prospects that they still have on their roster and in their system that didn't go on that deal. Yep. Um, that it was not, not the, uh, the biggest loss for them. Granted they were, they were dipping into a pretty deep pool of prospects, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, it, it's not as if the guys that they, they included in that trade weren't ones that they would have liked to have kept. Yeah. Um, but but they didn't put in Hughes, they didn't put in Nemich, they didn't put in Holtz, like or any of the the, the real real tip top players uh, in their system into that deal. Um, but yeah, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I think it's it's benefited both parties so far. I think Meyer in the last half of this season has been the guy that the Devils thought they were trading for. Like he's been everything they've needed on yep. a team where not a whole hell of a lot of people are being what they need right now. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 my impression of that back then was that just that even though there were teams interested, there weren't teams that were willing to kind of uh, pony up their grade A prospects like St. Louis, right? They were so said that they were interested, but you didn't hear them. Uh, I don't think that a guy like Snuggerud, you know, which you know no. would have been the equivalent of of maybe like a Nemec or something like that. Right? I don't think he was he was available. You know, if Buffalo was interested, Buffalo obviously had has has a lot of great prospects, but I don't think they were that interested. And so basically, I think it became only New Jersey willing to really kind of pony up. And so that's why, okay, well, if we're sort of the only team that's really into it, then like. Um, I don't, I don't know if Holtz, like even Holtz, I think like, uh, his star has fallen a little bit. I think the Sharks maybe could have got him, but, uh, well, he's, he's, he's young and he can't play defense yet, but I still think that he's, <laughs> he's, he's like a really good, good prospect. Yeah, no, he, he may, he may end up, end up being that, but definitely though, like Nemec and Hughes, those, those were like kind of your, also Mercer too. Uh, those, yeah, those there's a lot of talk about off- Mercer at that point too. Yeah. 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 A lot of off limits guys there, but, um, I don't know that that's just that was just sort of my 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 impression of it of of like that a lo- that there was there was a lot of criticism of the Sharks not getting sort of that great A asset back but yeah. if no team is offering it and you kind of feel like um I mean I guess they could have held him because he had one year left mm-hmm. but um uh I don't know yeah if no team is offering that then you sort of take your your best overall package I guess yep so, yeah. yep we'll take our Quentin Musty and run kind of thing that's what <laughs> right. the first round exactly felt. yeah um <laughs> I got one more, and I think Shang has a, a couple other after that. But I, I saw you mentioned, I think it was on Brody Brazil's broadcast, that you weren't a huge fan of Mackenzie Blackwood. I yeah, just want to like a, a, a little bit more about it. Why? Why exactly? Inconsistent. Like the mm-hmm. the things that you're seeing from him now are things that we, that Devils fans saw mm-hmm. for stretches over time, and then they they, they, they just disappear. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Just go away. <laughs> um, and, and and so I've I is you know it's like it's like when you see a. Uh, an NFL quarterback put together three good weeks. You're just like, okay, this is our guy. And then by the end of the season, you're you're looking to draft Kill, Caleb Williams. You know, it's like yeah. uh, you're saying uh, he's like Sam Howell or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's, so I, I, <laughs> for me, Blackwood was kind of like a fool me, fool me once, shame on on mm-hmm. on you, fool me seventeen times, shame on me. Yep. And uh, and so I'm not I'm not the biggest Mac Black guy. And we got a uh, a little bit of a do si do on goalies because we have Vanacek too. Do you have any any thoughts on Vanacek, I guess, from this year? I mean, I know he, was, he wasn't very he wasn't good. happy to leave Jersey. I can tell you that. I mean, Interesting. Like he, uh, he definitely was in his comments about the trade pretty, pretty salty about, I think, having having moved on. But um, again, like there are times when he is a very solid, competent goalie. Mm-hmm. And then there are times when he's not. And And, you know, in the case of his departure from the Devils, I mean, it was it was a situation for where one year he was a completely different goalie than he was the next year. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, last season they, had, they one of the reasons why the Devils waited so damn long to make a trade for a goalie is because they had the tenth best goaltending in the league last year, yeah. and then and then it became the thirty first. <laughs> so <laughs> like it, they it, they, it's something they didn't account for. It's something they didn't expect, and it really caught them off guard. And and one of the reasons why was the uh, just complete the evolution of Vanacek's game. Mm. I would ask you about Blackwood that um, 
you know, the first couple of years, there was so much hype around him. He was, uh, I think, a sixth in the Calder voting. Uh, there was talk that, you know, if there were the 2020, 2022 Olympics, that he was going to be Team Canada's starter. I mean, did your perception shift after all the injuries or even in the beginning, kind of, uh, you, uh, you kind of uh, uh, saw that inconsistency? He, he might still be Canada's starter based on their uh, <laughs> pool of, of, of candidates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know the injuries played a played a role in it. But again, like I said, it's just a matter of, of there, there were times in which he looked like he could be the goalie of the future. And then there were times when he clearly didn't, mm-hmm. and uh, and and there was a little bit more of the latter than the former for me, and and that's kind of what soured me on it. Okay, okay. Um, I have a one a big question left, and a one 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 quickie. Um, so I, I mentioned it a little earlier. So you've seen a lot of rebuilds. You you're watching a lot of rebuilds still. Uh, most fail, and so taking the lessons from teams like Buffalo that are still, you know, not, they're not rebuilding per se, but they're still building the senators building forever. The Oilers before they got Connor, um, just these long affinity builds, right? How, how can the sharks kind of avoid that? Because the Sabres made good draft picks. The senators have made good picks, right? It's not just about um, hitting on your draft picks. And so taking those examples, how can the sharks avoid that? Well, I mean, Ottawa was sort of a, a stop and start. Like Ottawa clearly tried to be probably more competitive than they 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 should have been. Mm-hmm. Um, the Oilers, you're right. Like the Oilers amassing of the Taylor Halls and Everleys and <laughs> all those players didn't work. And 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 if they didn't get Connor Goodell knows where they'd be right now. <laughs> I think in that case, it was just a, a, I think the market is was sort of toxic to a rebuild. Um and, and I think that that played into it. Buffalo, mm-hmm. um, jury's out man like i i i I wouldn't call that a failure quite yet i I still Mm. want to see what they end up doing with the coach the coaching position i think when you have darlene and and owen power to build around um you've got a pretty a pretty solid foundation uh and they've got a good a good collection of young players around them um i mean if you wanted to call the um o'reilly trade um you know a uh a part of the rebuild well then you know that bought you tage thompson right so it's like um so I don't know, like I, because like the teams you mentioned, yeah, they, they, they didn't work, but then like, you know, Tampa was a rebuild. Mm-hmm. Washington mm-hmm. was a rebuild. Pittsburgh sure. was a rebuild. Colorado. Like they're, they're, they're Chicago. Chicago. Like they're, yeah. they're the, the teams that have been like dominant in the last 15 years, by and large, were all rebuilds. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and some of the teams that have upward trajectory now. Are, are were rebuilds um the devil's excluded uh but but ho- hopefully next year included yeah so i i think overall like there there have been as many hits as misses and the hits mm. have been mega hits like the hits have been like you know barbie sure. <laughs> right? so, so i you know it gives you hope that if, that there are those scenarios in which if you if you get the certain you mm-hmm. know uh franchise level player um that you're going to be okay and, and again like by and large the teams that get the Celebrini level players turn out to be okay. Mm-hmm. Colorado turn out to be okay. Chicago turn out to be okay. Um, he's not Ovechkin and he's not Crosby and he's not McDavid, but like he's, he could be Stamkos. Like he, sure. he, he's, he's the kind of player from all projections that is not simply just going to be a, we have to take this guy cause he's, he's, he happens to be first that year. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. he's going to be, he's going to be Stamkos or Hughes or, or McKinnon or, or those types of players. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, and definitely for a Buffalo, it should work out uh, uh, eventually too. But I just think back to just how long it's taken, though, and that they did get one of those players in Eichel, sort of those key like franchise players, and it didn't quite obviously pan out with that. But um, but I don't know. Yeah, uh, but you're right though. I mean, the, just the upside of I'm I'm certainly not saying that the Sharks shouldn't do this, but like I just I just wonder how you can avoid like. Well- what happened with these other teams, but you make good points of like Ottawa I, maybe wasn't patient enough. Right. So, yeah, I think so pa- I was just going to say, Shang, yeah. that like patience is, is the virtue. I mean, you think about the number of coaching changes they've made in Buffalo, the number of coaching changes they made mm. in, in Edmonton, like during the early, you know, McDavid years or late Taylor Hall years, like it, you, you need to be able to have some consistency in your organization. And, um, and, and that's the thing. Like, I hope that going back to our conversation about Greer, like, I hope that he, um, has the right people in place, not only behind the bench, but also in player development to really like maximize the potential for the young players they're going to end up acquiring in the next few years. 
Oh man, Sharks fans, you're not gonna like it. David Quinn's gonna sign a three year contract this summer, so consistency. So. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I still like they, David. Quinn. Hey, listen, hey, listen. That, <laughs> I like that, him. I think David's. I like that's, David. That's, a, that's that was a, that's 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 an original <laughs> sin. Like that's the going hiring Quinn, and and we know why Greer did, but like mm-hmm. you know that that was his choice then, and and you'll you'll just have to deal with it. I mean, if the I guess the mandate was to be the worst team in the NHL. I mean. You know, Quinn is following the job. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hey, listen, it, it, you don't you don't want Tortorella back there. Like he's gonna no, make you a bubble well, team. So, yeah. You don't want yeah. that. So you, you want that. maybe made the right call there. Get Bruce Boudreaux out of retirement and make you know the it last shot. And, 60, 66 yeah, points. 16th, yeah, sixteenth uh, in the league. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my last one for you, Greg, and thank you uh, so much for your time. It's just a, a a quick prediction here. When do you think the Sharks will make the playoffs again? Oh, I'd say. Uh, uh, three, 2045. <laughs> I feel like you're going to think of the decades and four, all the years. Uh, <laughs> three years with Celebrini, four years without him. Okay, that's oh, pretty good. Actually, that's actually not bad. All right, yeah. that's, that's better than most. Starting yeah. the summer. This the yeah. time. The timer starts this summer. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Love it. I think four. So four years with, uh, let's say, Artem uh, Lashunov. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, they've they've got players like. Like yeah, I said, like, you know, Eklund Smith, like they've got, they've got guys that are sort of, you know, going to be part of whatever they're building next. It's just that if you don't have that guy, then you either, you know, you, you, you continue searching for him and be this bad again next year, or you end up like the Red Wings and just try to build whatever you can around not having that guy. Oh, that's yeah. another sort of a thin build there too. Right. Recently. So but anyway, yeah. And, so and, and, and again, there, like, but- they're Arizona. They're they're a team that yeah. was bad for several seasons, but never lucked out in the lottery. Mm, yeah, and fair. then you know they've got good, really good young players. Cider, uh, you know, Larkin, obviously, much like the Coyotes have guys like uh, you know Logan Cooley, but they don't have the guy. They don't mm-hmm. have Matthews. They don't have Jack Hughes. They don't have the the guy to really kind of coalesce everything. And that's hopefully what the Sharks end up with this summer. Well, thank you so much for uh, a little a ray of uh, uh, sunlight. It's uh, been a very uh, dark and gloomy year. So Mike Greer coming home with the GM of the Year Award would be... <laughs> not, Music not to be our so, ears, for be, sure. That would be great. To... <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, I, I'm a, I'm a, I play a cynic online, and I'm cynical in my nature because I'm from New Jersey. But my wife always tells me that I'm, like, one of the most abjectly optimistic people she's ever met so I, i've often thought about that that juxtaposition mm. i think i'm i'm very effusive and optimistic about certain things my career being one of them and yeah. uh and then cynical about other things <laughs> the devils the devil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be started on that. Oh, jesus yeah. yeah thanks so much for joining us greg anytime thanks for having me Bye. thank you greg take care boys